Well, good evening and welcome to Milton Speaks Candidates Night. This is like probably the 20th time we've done this for the annual town election. And uh, I'm Bernie Lynch and uh, the guy with the red face. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have Pat Desmond for the, uh, uh, the, the time. We have Dave Johnson, who we just dug up from the old Milton record transcript. Mm -hmm. And we have Frank Scroth, Old 186, My Town Matters. What a, what a great publication that is. Um, the selectmen are going to be up first. Um, we're not going to have a rebuttal from each candidate uh, answering what, a, what a, another candidate had said. So we're going to start off by uh, a question to, to the candidate. They've got one minute to answer it. We used to have any of their competition could rebut that, but it's, it's just too long. And um, we're not going to have opening remarks, as I said again. We will have closing remarks. Um, so the first question is going to be to Dennis Cohane, the incumbent, and that's the way it is. On a, a, any of these contested offices, the, uh, the, the first name on the ballot has uh, answers the first question in that particular office. And the closing remarks, uh, the person that's on the end of the last name on the ballot is, is going to have uh, the first closing remarks. Some offices have four candidates, others have um, two. So now who wants to ask the first question? Sure. Okay. Age has beauty. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Bernie. And if I could take one second for that beef plug I mentioned, that there is going to be a second forum at Fuller Village on April 11th at 1 o'clock. All the candidates are invited. I will be hosting it, but uh, it will also be the fourth year that I've partnered with the Milton High School debate team. So the debate team will actually be uh, the individuals asking the questions and managing uh, the forum. And yeah, it's a great, it's, it's, so, it's a great thanks. show. Uh, Okay, so thank you for letting me do that, Bernie. Um, the first question, uh, a committee of town officials had recommended that six to $700,000 of free cash be used to cover operating expenses for FY16, with the notion that that would function as a bridge to the following year, at which time we would ask for an override. Do you support asking for an override that year? Dennis, I guess it's to you first. Do I support next year? This notion that it's a bridge to an override the following year, yes. we're going to ask for an override. Do you support and will you, will you aggressively support an override? The answer is yes. I will aggressively support it, an override. Um, we did use about $680,000 to, uh, to plug a hole, basically, um, in our operating budget. The Department of Revenue doesn't look favorably on, on using free cash to plug, and, plug these holes, but it was either that or we go out for an override this year. And I felt that, and one of my other selectmen felt that, because we had so much free cash, 2.9 million, um, that it would be almost impossible to sell it to the, to the residents of the town. <clears throat> so we made a decision to use about 680,000 just to plug that hole for this year with the view of going out for uh, a full override next year because next year we basically won't have enough money to pay the bills. So yes, I will be supporting it fully. Look at that a minute, you, you're genius. Go ahead, Dave. So um, a minute. You know, I think I, I'm, I reluctantly uh, support an override. I think though, uh, and the reason why I will support it is because I think that it's necessary that our schools, um, you know, really get the attention that they they deserve. You know, people move to Milton because of our great school system. Although I, I, I really believe that free cash should be used for one-time capital expenditures. You know, I've spoken to other town administrators in other towns who are in a strong form of government. And it's of their opinion and of my opinion that, you know, especially looking at the winter we had this past year, that we should be looking at, uh, you know, for instance, the DPW, uh, using some of that money uh, to fix some of the equipment or get purchased other equipment that we could use um, so that we're prepared under dire circumstances like we were this past winter. So. Um, you know, I reluctantly do support it and would support it, uh, but I think that we ought to be fiscally responsible in planning uh, and come up with a long-range plan. I think, um, you know, I think that looking for a three- to five-year plan and how we're going to do our finances, I think that's going to be an appropriate uh, measure to, to look forward to in the future. Look at that, another minute. Boy, you guys are professionals. <laughs> we'll, we'll, Pat will ask the next one, and then Dave. 
Yes, I actually had another override question because this year there is an override on the ballot. And this is the override for the medical expenses for a injured firefighter, firefighter who was injured in 2009, um, Antonio Pickens. And this is, is more money than is actually needed for this year, but apparently um, the Board of Selectmen very quietly put this in the warrant. Uh, and I'd like to know what you both think about this, and and not just whether you're going to support it, but you know, do you think this is how to do business? Uh, well, I think that um, I think that obviously we have a responsibility as a town uh, to support Mr. Pickens. Um, you know, he obviously was report, re responding to an accident and and was hit, as I know, by a, by a drunk driver. And, and uh, thank God that he's made it through this. And and uh, I know that we should be supporting him. Um, at the same point in time, I know that we've used free cash in the past or bond. And I think that if we use the $500,000 in bonding, it would end up at about $642,000, which is over $100,000 more uh, paying it in that regard. So I think that um, coming up with another plan, um, kind of a, not a stabilization fund, but some sort of uh, kitty or a, or a special fund for Antonio Pickens um, that the town could go in an override, I'd support that. I think that that's probably the best measure for the town to save money long term. And, I, and as, I, as I know, I think that his expenses or bills have gone down a shade since they first initiated. So I think that it would be uh, fiscally responsible for the town to look at that measure. Good. Dennis? Yeah, I'm quite similar to what Dave said. We really have no option but to go out for an override this year. and. Quite frankly, we, we can't not have it be approved. And we're borrowing the money every year to pay um, Firefighter Pickens medical bills, which we're obligated to do. And if we borrow 500,000 over 10 years of a bond, it, it does turn out to be about 650,000 in repayments. And that's every year. And we're borrowing this money every single year. So the Department of Revenue, when they came out and they did their uh, study, of the town, they recommended that we not borrow any more money, that we actually go out for an override. And the cost to the taxpayer, I believe, is about $58 per year. When we pay back the 500000 when we borrow it, it's actually about $78 per person. So it actually works out to be much less money by going for an override and borrowing the money that way. So yes, I'll be supporting that. And Pat, you did mention, well, I know a minute is up, quietly. I don't think it was done quietly. Um, I mean, it, it was discussed in, in public. The only thing we didn't do was actually get out there and, and tell the public about it. And that's what we're doing now. We have a committee together. It is going to be uh, advertised this week. Dave, you want 15 seconds? No, I, I, okay. I, I agree. I think that that's the best know, interest of the town. Yeah, moving forward. Right. Friends. Dave Johnson. Uh, should the town administrator be given the exclusive right to hire the police chief or a selectman giving up too much power if they agree to that? Uh, I, I think you yeah, first. Do we swap? Yeah. 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 Um, I struggled with that question, uh, Dave, and it took me a little bit of time to agree to this proposed strong town administrator um, warrant article that's coming in front of town meeting in May. And quite frankly, it was the only part of the agreement that I did struggle with. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm in agreement with a town administrator, a strong town administrator hiring and being able to fire a police chief or a fire chief. Um, so I've come to terms with it. I think I'll support it. I'm really going to make a decision on town meeting floor. I do agree with a strong town administrator. That's the only part of it that I'm not really comfortable with. There is a, a proviso in there that if the town administrator hires or fires a, a police chief or fire chief, that there's a 15-day window that the Board of Selectmen can over, overrule that decision. So that's the only thing that makes me happy at this particular point. So... Um like Mr. Cohane, you know, I, I struggle with this a little bit, and, and I worked in a strong form of government in the town of Westwood when I was a department head, and uh, it was very effective having a strong town administrator. 
Though when they did go through a selection of a police chief, the Board of Selectmen were involved with that town administrator. So it was a combination. I would be in favor of a combination. I think that uh, with a fire chief or a police chief, public safety, I think that that's at a different level. And I think that um, you know it's a collaboration of good minds where I actually believe the school superintendent should be involved and other key players in the town. I think that um, by doing that, I think that um, you're involving a lot of people who are going to be dealing with the police chief on a regular basis or the fire chief on a regular basis. Um, and I think that that would be the most effective. So if there was some variance to it, um, then that's where I would support. I, I believe, though, that the town administrator and, the, and the, the, um, the government study committee has done a fabulous job. Um, I'm strongly in favor of this town going to that. I've seen how effective working in that uh, arena, how effective it could be, and, and so that's where I stand on it. Frank? Thank you. Uh, in the five years that I've been covering the town, uh, the Hendry's building is still standing and the animal shelter still isn't. The question is, and those are just two examples, but the question is, what measures might you take or might you recommend to improve the pace of progress in the town and bring resolution to issues that have been lingering for such a long period of time? Well, I think um, one of the things that, that, that I'm running my campaign on is, is, um, is integrating the community into a lot of the development, um, especially in the commercial districts. Uh, I believe that all the communities uh, or neighborhoods in, um, in Milton should have a say um, and have a good feel with the Board of Selectmen as to what is being planned. Uh, it should be transparent, open-air discussions so that we can get it right. I think that, um, in my opinion, you know, and, and being a lifelong resident of town, that um, things have been done last second, and I think it's stalled projects. Um, I think that, um, you know, if we involve the community, we work with the community on a daily basis um, and integrate them in the process along with the planning board, which is um, obviously doing a good job right now, um, then we'll be in a much better position to be able to move some of these projects forward. The Hendrys. I don't know where to start with that. Um, maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this, but I, you know, there's so many projects have been proposed and approved and built in Milton while this Henry's project has been proposed and proposed and proposed and it's still not built. I believe if the developer was somebody other than who owns it, this building would have been built a long time ago. Um, there is no doubt that this town, in particular the Board of Selectmen, bent over backwards twice to get this built and still no progress. And it's very frustrating. Now I am a developer in the city of Boston primarily and a huge part of my business is neighborhood input. There really has been no neighborhood input with the Hendrys and that's one thing that I would support in future. There has to be community meetings after community meetings, get the input, hire the proper lawyers that know the ins and outs of the town government and, um, and get it done. But other than that, we're still, we're just going to have stall tactics, and it's frustrating. I, I don't know where to end with this. Another question? Yes, I would like to know a little bit about your feeling for town government. There's been a lot of talk about taking some of the boards that are now in existence or elective offices and turning them into appointments that, that are under the control of the selectmen. And, um, you know, how do you feel in terms of, of Milton going forward? Is it what should happen? When you're talking about elected, are you talking about elected positions or appointed positions? There's been talk about the treasurer being That's an, an elected appointed. position. Right, yeah. right now it's elected, becoming an appointed position. Right. There's been talk about the cemetery and parks coming under the selectmen. Um, you know, it, to have a more centralized form of government. Right. There's been a lot of talk about um, it. That's a good question, Pat. With the, with the town, not the town account, the, uh, the treasurer, I, I would not be in favor of making it uh, an appointed position. It's, it's really difficult to fill a treasurer's position there. You know, uh, our, our town treasurer in Milton gets job offers every day from 
from towns in Massachusetts that just can't fill the position. Um, I would rather see it a, an elected position whereby you get an accountant or somebody that's just qualified and can go out and sell himself to the public will get, we'll get elected to the position versus trying to go out and find a person. I don't think that would work. Um, the other positions you're talking about, consolidating cemetery and parks, yes. I'd love to bring the cemetery and parks under the Consolidated Facilities Department. I really would. I'd love to have Bill Ritchie uh, take over the maintenance of, the, of, the, of those buildings, uh, cemetery and parks, because we're going to have to do something. There's not much more room for development here. We have to save money somewhere, and I believe consolidating the facilities will do it. Okay. Yeah, I think that um, I, I really believe that um, in going to the strong form of government, it's going to really uh, help the town of Milton out uh, in efficiencies. Um, I think that, um, you know, I'm not in favor of, uh, like Dennis, uh, the town treasurer, I think that, that Jim McGauliffe does a phenomenal job. I think uh, we're very fortunate to have him. But I think we have to look at other things, and I think that it's going to be a step-by-step -step basis. I look at the Parks Department, um, and, and I've worked in a town in Westwood that's a well-oiled machine, along with other towns like Needham and uh, Wellesley that are very similar, that we like to call ourselves equivalent to, if not better than. And, um, you know, they have their uh, turf managed by the DPW, uh, so which in fact here would be consolidated services if it could fall under there, and recreation would be the standalone. Recreation is a big deal, because recreation encompasses so many more things than just what you think a kid goes out and plays ball in the streets with. It encompasses library, it's human service, library, council on aging, recreation, schools. In Westwood we streamline a program where the schools worked with the town and, and municipal government. Non-duplication of services, that's the key. I think that's what you're looking to do is get more efficiency, less tax dollars spent, and more programs. Dave Frank. Yeah, we've talked about, or you've talked about Spending money more effectively. What about increasing the pot? Governor LePage in Maine is trying to change the law in Maine to uh, change the status of nonprofit organizations to force them to pay taxes, unlike the pilot program. Would you, as selectman, should the Milton selectman formally endorse such a proposal, seeing that Milton has such an unusually high percentage of tax exempt land? Well, I'm glad you asked that. You know, I actually created the pilot program in the city of Boston under Tom, Tom, Mayor, Mayor Tom Menino. Um, I actually wrote a paper at Northeastern um, for going towards my public administration that uh, Councillor Steve Murphy championed. So um, there are other ways versus just getting money, okay? There are other ways. Northeastern, for instance, gave scholarships, the Joe Moakley Scholarship, for which I was a recipient of, uh, to be able to go to college or get my uh, master's degree for free, uh, for which I finished half of. And um, I think that if we look at other avenues with Milton Academy, with the hospital, you know, whether they be teaching courses um, for adults, I think that those are appropriate measures that we should be looking at. Uh, but I think also as a town, we need to, uh, we need to look at more public-private partnerships. I think that that's something that, uh, you know, I've done well in my past that, that, uh, that I'd be really, you know, looking forward to, uh, to working with department heads to support their operating budgets. Thank you. Your question is, Dave, would I support changing well, the legislation? Milton, should Massachusetts start changing the law so that you don't have to rely on inadequate pilot programs right. that are voluntary and yeah. go through this? I, I'd love to see that happen. I really would. Year. I'd love to see it happen with some nonprofits, not all, because some deserve to be protected. There's no doubt about that, such as religious. But I know Dave um, supported the one in Boston. I actually started the pilot committee in Milton. And we are presenting it to the selectmen uh, in the next two meetings, uh, a draft that we're going to send out to all nonprofits in Milton. You know, our, our big three nonprofits in Milton, which is Curry College, Milton Hospital, and Milton Academy, if they were for profit, they'd be paying $6.4 million a year in taxes. But instead, we get about 80 grand. And it's not good enough. And so our pilot program is suggesting that they pay up to. 10 to 15 percent, which would be a half a million dollars. I'd like to see that. Would I like to see the legislation change? Absolutely. Do I think it's going to happen? No. So this is why we're implementing a pilot program. We're going to present it to our nonprofits in the next couple of months, and hopefully they'll agree and pay. Thank you, Frank. How many more questions are you going to ask, Brian? Um, 
until they start getting tired. I, mean, this, this is the, <laughs> I don't think they're going to get tired. <laughs> Okay, I, can I, 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 well, well, you know, when you have no more, then we'll end it. All right. All right. Um, circling back to, to Pat's point about the um, strong town government and the appointment of, of officials, et cetera, et cetera. In the, in the strong town government model, the concept is that a lot of day-to-day uh, -day operational authority is delegated to the town administrator, and the board of selectmen would assume more strategic policy-making types of function. With the completion of the master plan, uh, I guess the two questions. One, did you do you support the master plan, and did you support the development of it? If not, why not? And if you did, of the seven goals they identified, which of those do you think would be a strategic priority? Um, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I actually do support the master plan. I think it, uh, it's great that, that we're looking at long-range planning, strategic planning. Um, I think that, um, you know, I think that what, what Milton needs to do uh, is focus a lot of attention on min the municipal side um, in restructuring, reorgan reorganizing um, the form of government so that that town administrator actually has the ability to hold people accountable. Because I think we have some great department heads in this town, and I think that if they're given the support that they desperately need, that we'll have more efficient government, and I think that we'll have better resources and better delivery services. So I think that that's one of the focuses. I think that also, I think that involving the neighborhoods in, in more capacities and listening to them, getting them to be stakeholders at the table uh, to enable uh, them to have some say in the planning process for what happens next, that's very important. They're the taxpayers. They're the ones that we need to focus on. They're paying an awful lot of taxes in Milton right now, and I don't believe they're getting the services that they deserve right now. Uh, yes, I do support the master plan. I did attend many of the meetings, which are uh, very enjoyable, very informative. Um, one of the things that intrigued me was housing. Uh, you know, I'm, a re I'm in the real estate uh, business, and right now we have a huge shortage of housing in Milton, in particular for our elderly population. There is absolutely, and that's the part of the master plan I would support, the housing. There is uh, very little, if any, um, condominiums, townhouse condominiums available for people to downsize. Um, the master plan is basically a blueprint for the town to move forward. Um, and being in housing, many elderly people, in particular uh, over 65 years old, we're going to have 60,000 people a day turning 60 every day for the next 10 years. That's a mouthful, right? Uh, and this is because of the baby boom population. There is no housing available for the elderly. So that's the part of the master plan I would support. <clears throat> Thanks. You can do a, do a question too? Uh, yeah, I'll pass it in and then we'll let these guys uh, close. Sure. A question. Do you have? Um, I have a question okay. about okay. Pulte. Um, a few years ago, Pulte Corporation, or whatever it's called, LLC, whatever it is, um, made a proposal to the town to buy land at the town farm. And um, the selectmen chose Pulte, thinking that that was some kind of a good deal for the town. Um, I think the, the town has spent quite a bit of money so far on moving that deal forward, and I haven't seen anything happen, um, except the, the selectmen have extended that agreement time and time again. Um, and I'd like to know what you both think about it. Um, do either of you think it's time to scrap it and go back to square one? Or do you think that those kinds of housing that, that they're proposing is the way to go? Well, <clears throat> obviously this Pulte deal was done on a previous board uh, to what, when I was on it. I read the purchase and sales when I ran for this position three years ago, and I was shocked. I mean, you could, there were so many loopholes for Pulte to get out of it. Uh, there's no way I would have signed it. Plus, they put up a $200,000 bond. It cost them a couple of hundred dollars to put up that much of a deposit. So if they pull out of the deal, it's an insurance company is paying the town 200000 I didn't agree with that. There's a lot of issues. We, there's a need for less 
expensive housing in Milton right now. These are going to be million and a half to two million dollar homes. Not sure if there's a market there. Maybe there is, but there's more of a market for the six to seven hundred thousand dollar range. I'd love to have seen that built there. There's also some problems right now with this hundred foot buffer. And we've had our lawyers and Pulte lawyers, and there's a, there's a discrepancy with the, with the um, Indian Cliffs Neighborhood Association over a hundred foot buffer. If I had my chance and if I was on this board, I would have went with the Copeland Foundation. They've given $18 million to the town over the last number of years. They could have bought it for two and a half to $3 million, made green space out of it, or put some affordable housing there, and, um, and plus, continue contributing to the town, which would have been a way more than the $5 million that Pulte Homes are, is paying for the land. Dave, take a little time. Yeah, yeah no, I, um, I agree with Dennis right there. I think that the town should have given the land uh, or sold the land to the Copeland Foundation. I thought that that would have been the wisest move. I think that um, you know right now it's the, the 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 poor in the town are the ones that are being affected by this. That they're um, and there are an awful lot of poor people in this town, and, and I hope that people don't forget that. You know, and I think that um, I think that it, it's unfortunate, in my opinion, that this deal was done the way it was done. I think that uh, there was opportunity to do it right, like Mr. Cohane did say. I think that um, you know if, if they looked at this, I'm an advocate of open space. You know, I like to preserve old Milton. You know, I personally don't think that we should be putting condos up all over the place. I think that we should uh, we should be advocating for open space and and uh, and also uh, protecting our poor. And I think that if if this if this deal could be relooked at, and and we had another opportunity to go at it, then I think we should. I'm just going to inter interfere for one minute. That, that was the question I was going to have. Is there any way that the selectmen could revisit this? I don't think so right now, Bernie, unless there's a problem. There's an issue right now that may not be resolved, unfortunately, after all these years. If Pulte decides to pull the plug on it, then we can revisit it again. But right now, we're obligated, we're contracted to move forward. So there's a PNS and force and penalties and... Correct. We're under contract to move forward. Okay. But there is a discrepancy in the PNS right now that's being... It, it's all down to interpretation. It's one word of an inter... We're interpreting it one way, the neighbors are interpreting it a different way, Pulte's interpreting the same word. That's why you have attorneys, different. right? Right. So if something happens with that and Pulte pulls, it's back on the market. I have one last question. Um, we, you know, we've asked you about specific issues. There's Henry's, there's Pulte, pilot payments, etc. <clears throat> what is the, the one issue that's important to you above all other issues? The one issue to this town that you would champion regardless of the political risk that at the end of three years you would look back and say, you know, I did everything I could to make that happen. What would that thing be? Is it me or Dennis? I don't know. Anyone. <laughs> I think it's to you, David. Okay, so. It's, it's Dave's turn. It's a tough question because I've got a few. Um, uh, but one thing that I would like to see, I mean, I, I, I struggle I, with, with the commercial the commercial side. You know, I just think that, that we have three commercial districts in, in town, and I just don't believe the neighborhood has had the access that they deserve to be a part of the process. You know, we have a great opportunity to lower the tax base by increasing existing commercial development where it exists, but at the same point in time, it's a very delicate, delicate issue because you have to involve the community. There's a lot of things with traffic, with, uh, with pedestrians, you know, there's a lot of young kids, um, you know, and we've seen a lot of good things happen, but there are some vacancies, okay? And I think that it's important that we work really hard with the neighborhoods. I think that it's a way to bring our tax base down for residents that are paying a lot of money. But we really need the community to be a part of it, and I'm going to be a strong advocate for those community people. The last thing that I want to say, though, is that I think that we really need to create some sort of streamlined operation between the municipal and the schools. If we do that, we won't duplicate services. We'll have, uh, I would hope that we'd have an HR director for both. We'd also have an ability to have one budget, one payroll, under one system that I think would save the town money long term. 
during the snowstorm, I, I learned a lot in, in February. And I always said to people, <clears throat> you know, when you come home from, from work in the evening, you want your trash barrel empty, we negotiate that contract. You go up and you turn on your lights, we negotiate that contract. You turn on your shower, we negotiate the contract with the MWRA for your water. People want the simple mm -hmm. things. But most importantly, I believe they want, when they pick up the phone to call Town Hall or the DPW, they want a return phone call. They want communication. And that is one thing that was lacking this year, I noticed. It's the number one complaint that comes to me as a selectman. And I'm in a business whereby I have to operate at lightning speed. I, I, I work in a shark-infested real estate development business in Boston. And we make lightning-fast decisions. And if I call Town Hall and I don't get a phone call back, that's a problem. If a resident, and I have access to Town Hall, if a resident calls Town Hall, they don't get a, a phone call, that, that's a bigger problem to me. It's something I will be looking out for over the next uh, three years, and I hope to resolve it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, question? Oh, oh the, the 40B. If you, if, <clears throat> would you two like to talk about the Randolph Ave 40B that the selectmen recently have allowed um, access through the DPW yard for a 40B that a lot of the residents in the area oppose? Right. Um, and I'd like to know how you both feel about that. Well, the, I made sure the minutes of that meeting, that executive session meeting, were released uh, at the last meeting. I voted not to allow them through um, the DPW yard. This is a project that is not what I would call not smart growth. Now, I learned from a few good developers before me, if you get a lot of resistance, you don't build there. You move to the next place or the next site. This is a... This is a, a site on a busy state highway that, in my opinion, is the least of all the sites in Milton to build smart growth. 90 units, probably 180 people, 90 cars, um, a burden on our schools, burden on our police force and fire. There's no way I would support it, and I'm very, very disappointed that my, my board uh, voted the majority to allow the developers to go through our DPW yards, the taxpayer's yard, so that they could save $100,000 um, testing the soil. There's no way I would allow it. I've never been allowed in any municipality that I've built in. I don't see why we should be offering favors to these developers. Okay, uh, well, I support affordable housing uh, to meet the needs of our residents, because we have a lot of residents that uh, they can't quite afford to live uh, in our town that would like to live here. You know, they might be living at home with their mother and father and stuff, but. I do agree that I don't believe that we should have allowed access to the DPW yard, which is a taxpayer expense there. And I think, though, that we also have to look at where, um, where affordable housing can go. It's got to have adequate infrastructure around it. And I think that it's an, an important um, component. And I know that the planning board obviously takes that very seriously, and they work really hard um, um, to make sure that they do their due diligence and, and, and stuff. But I think that at the same point in time, I think we need to be uh, active, since we aren't uh, filling our responsibility to find those places, because we do have people here in town that would benefit from that. You do have one probably the last question. Well, yeah, thank you. I have a totally um, different direction I'd like to go in. All of the streets, major roads in Boston, like Hyde Park Avenue, say evacuation route. When you come into Milton, those signs disappear. Assuming there is an incident, and you've got hundreds of thousands of people coming out of Boston. What is Milton supposed to do with them? Where are they supposed to go? Are you at all prepared for any contingency? Well, David, I think that's a great question because, um, you know, and I know that Milton does have an emergency management plan, um, but, you know, and I don't want to kind of spin this off in a different direction, but I want to tell you that, you know, this last winter was further proof that we really don't have the communication nor the wherewithal uh, or the organization um, to pull off something uh, which was somewhat of a um, disaster, if you want to call it that. Um, it was a weather disaster. So, um, you know, I really challenge the current board right now, and I challenge the town and, uh, and future boards moving forward um, to really stay ahead of the curve on these things and to, and to make it real discussions and to come up with a, a policy and procedure um, for 
uh, potential disasters, whether they be weather related or uh, natural disasters, or, uh, or it could be, um, unfortunately, like something um, you know, that we saw in the marathon. I mean, we don't know. We can't account for what could possibly happen. So I think that we should have a plan. Uh, I think that residents should be aware of these plans. And I think that it's important um, that the board, as policy and advisors, uh, hopefully in this new form of strong government, uh, set that tone. Is Milton still in the Fall River FEMA district? I don't know the it answer It used to, to be. The selectmen used to discuss yeah, it. They the wanted to, to be in Boston. I thought that was rather odd that it was in I don't know that answer. Fall River's planning district. Yeah. And I, to be honest with you, Dave, I'm not sure if we do have an evacuation plan. It's something I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, this is how we learn, right? Um, I can't answer the question. You know, um, I'd be guessing. But it's something I will be looking into with our police chief, uh, Richard Wells. So. You know, we have so many planes going overhead. Mm -hmm. We should have definitely an evacuation mm -hmm. plane crash. Well, I do know that we have, we have we four, four state roads and we have six bridges that enter and leave Milton. So mm -hmm. we definitely are able to get out of Milton. Should we let, leave these guys go? Or should we, anyone want to, no zingers or anything? Closing statement. Closing statement. Closing statement. OK, so uh, Dave makes the closing statement because uh, okay. Dennis says, Get the first question. Great. It can be up to three minutes. And thank you guys for hosting us today. Bernie, I appreciate uh, from MATV, Pat, uh, Dave, and Frank, you know, really appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to share with the viewers kind of where we stand on some of the issues. Uh, to the viewers that haven't met me yet, this is an opportunity for me to introduce my candidacy, which I think is far too important to me in our town. So I prepared a statement to explain to you who I am and why I've chosen to run. I'm proud to be born and raised in this community. I'm running for selectman because I love Milton and I want to utilize my talents for this community to make Milton the very best town that it can be. I'm here tonight because I believe that making a difference in Milton, I believe that I'll resonate with the, with the voters with some of my experiences to make government more efficient for local government. My two parents, Marion and Chuck, raised six children here in town. And all of us went to Milton Public Schools. Fortunate, married to my beautiful wife, April. We have two kids, one at Glover School and one at the Campbell School. James is in second grade. I'm a proud graduate myself of Tucker School, Pierce Middle School, and BC High. I went on to graduate from Boston College with a degree in political science and sociology and worked towards my education and my master's degree at Northeastern University. My professional work experience includes coaching baseball at Boston College and Harvard, three years negotiating Major League Baseball contracts as a player agent, 13 years of municipal experience uh, in administration as a department head for the city of Boston and also for the town of Westwood. I was able to manage over 250 employees as a city of Boston department head. When I worked in the town of Westwood, I worked in a strong form of government, so I'm very capable in, to understand the transitionary period that, would be, that we would be uh, effectively under should it go to that point. Um, I'm looking forward to, de to uh, delivering efficient services. I currently work as a business development director at J.N. Phillips Auto Glass I'm in government relations. One thing that my parents imparted to me is the importance of community service and the values, and I want to teach that to my children as well. I encourage everyone here in the audience who's listening to visit my website, burnsformilton.org. I have a platform of ideas that I think will be awfully, uh, in, will interest uh, our residents. Um, and I think that in closing, Milton is an amazing community. It's by no accident that we've been able to recognize repeatedly, we've been recognized repeatedly as one of the best communities to live in in Massachusetts. We owe it to many public servants who have come before me in dedicated years and decades of making Milton the beautiful community that it is today. It's my turn to pick up that torch and my experience to use my talents for my hometown. I'm excited and energetic about what it is to come from Milton, and I'm passionate and I'm excited to share my vision to effectively move Milton forward. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. I respectfully ask for you to cast your vote for me, David T. Burns, on April 28th. We're about three minutes. Dennis? Three minutes? Think you can do it three minutes? I doubt it. <laughs> thank you, Bernie, for moderating this forum uh, every year. And thank you to David and Frank and Pat. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dennis Cohane, one of your current selectmen in Milton and a candidate for re-election for the board for a second term. I'm also a town meeting member
for many years from Precinct 5, former school committee member, and a member of multiple other boards. I'm a 22-year resident of Milton. I'm married to my lovely wife, Mary, for the past 24 years, and we have three grown daughters, aged 21, 20, and 18, two in college and one in high school, entering college this September. Unlike my opponent, I was neither born nor raised in Milton or Massachusetts or even the U.S. I was born and raised in County Cork in Ireland. Came to the United States in January of 1988 when I was 21 in search of what most people came here for, opportunity and a chance to succeed. I am proud of the fact that through hard work and dedication, I have achieved much success. I started my own company in 1989 at the age of 22 in real estate investing and development. Thankfully, today is a very successful company and has given my family and I a wonderful life. On May 1st, 1998 was one of my proudest moments in America. That was the day I was sworn in as a naturalized American citizen. And from that day to this, I have not missed a single vote, and I'm proud of that. America has been great to me, and so my wife and I decided it was time to give back. Now, to give back to the town where we raised our children and made our home 22 years ago, and to do it without pay. So I went back to college, to UMass Boston and to Eastern Nazarene for five years at the age of 37, graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in business at the age of 42. Not an easy thing to do while raising children and bu building a business, but only in America can this be done. With that degree, I ran for the school committee and town meeting and won. I learned all about the budget that the schools have, the biggest in town, served on the finance committee for the schools for two years, meeting every Monday morning at 7 a.m. in Mary Gormley's office. I was able to bring my business and negotiating skills with unions to the table. With that school experience in hand, as well as an immense experience of running my own company, I ran successfully for this position as a selectman three years ago as against a 12-year incumbent. I promised many changes, and I'm proud to say that all of those promises I made were met, every single one of them. I have proven that I've proven to all residents that I am different, that I get things done because it's how I'm conditioned from the private sector, that I have the courage and the confidence to say no, to question a department head in public fairly but justly for the benefit of all and the good of our town. I represent both Miltons, old and new, that we are experiencing today. I know exactly what makes Milton unique, why people move here and what we have to do going forward to make sure that it remains unique but with subtle changes that complement our town. I am the change that Milton needed, but there is much more to do and it can't be done in one term. I'm ready for the challenge again for another three years. I am the experience, the knowledge, the expertise, the communicator during the winter storms when residents were desperate for leadership, and I was there. I will be there again for you, for all residents and not just for some. My door is always open. My phone is never turned off. I look forward to volunteering my time again for another three years if you give me the chance to. Thank you. Dave, you want a couple of minutes? Uh, no, I think I'm, I'm fine, Bernie. I, um, I do want to just, uh, just a, a, a quick rebuttal that I do believe, though, that um, you know, I think we need to really give our department heads the opportunity during um, crisis to, uh, to step up and kind of oversee operations. I think that um, the board itself should not be micromanagers. I believe that they should actually be policy and advisory role um, in, in that matter and, uh, and allow our town administrator to do her job. So I think that it's one of the things that I'm going to be focused on. Uh, it's, I'm going to be one of those persons that is a collaborator, um, someone that, who uh, is easy to work with, especially with the communities, and one that isn't going to be uh, overwhelming and micromanaging some of, um, some of our fine talent. Dennis, whack back and forth. I'm good. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, gentlemen. Well, Thank you very much. 28th of April is... Uh, the 28th of April. 28th, yeah. right. That's what it says here, I hope. Yep. <laughs> 28th of April. And thanks for coming, guys. Thanks, Bernie. Dennis, thank you. Thanks. Good job. Good job. Good job, Bernie. Yeah, good. Always good. Yep. Thank you again. Great job.
Okay, I'll go. Um, thanks for coming. Again this year, music and art have borne the brunt to meet the budget cuts required by the schools for, the bud for their budget. Chapter 70 funds may help to restore some of those cuts. However, the policy of the schools has been to cut music and art before math and science. Is this a policy that you agree with? Well, I think I get the question first. Thanks for the tough question to start, Frank, and thank you all for having us. Um, I think that this is a very difficult decision that the school board has to make, and I wish that the school committee didn't have to make that decision. We heard earlier about some long-range forecasting and plans that are needed for our town, and I think that uh, we need to do a better job of that three- to five-year plan and looking ahead and when we need to time our uh, overrides and when we need to cut back so that we don't have to make teacher cuts. I think it's unfortunate that we're faced with this question this year uh, when we knew that we were going to have this deficit and you know, I think it's almost a shame that we're looking at the free cash the way that we are because it gave us a false sense of security this year and uh, I hope we're not faced with that same problem next year or else people will say, oh, maybe we shouldn't have a, uh, an override this year because we have free cash. I think we need to make a commitment to our students and to our teachers and not put ourselves in a position where we need to make cuts. Um, but I, to answer your question more directly, I do not like cutting art and music. Um, I, I would need to know a little bit more about what is mandated and how much time students need to have in those science classes before I can answer that question fully. Sheila? Yep. Um, well, first of all, just to say, I know um, as of today that all the cuts that were proposed are back in with the 120,000 that are going back into the budget. Um, the the uh, time of 45 minutes of music to 30 is back to 45. Um, fifth grade chorus is back that was once cut. So we're at the same level of music classes um, that for next year that we were this year. So that's a good thing. Um, however, after being in schools for so many years um, and going through lots of budget presentations um, and being a town meeting member for 10 years, the schools, the schools are, are always the largest budget because this every year you, you, know, you can do the best you can with um, censuses and figuring out how many people will be coming in. But, um, you don't know when kids come in how many people are going to have to be on IEPs, how many um, services students are going to, going to need. And you have to, you have to meet those needs of the students. And I feel like when the tough decisions need to be made um, and seeing the cuts that were made this year, that al although, again, you don't want to cut any art in music, my daughter, who is a freshman at the high school and a big, big, uh, musical theater person at both Pierce and the high school um, and a big choir advocate. There was no fifth grade chorus. There was 30 minutes of music. We had art at that time every other week. Um, we, didn't, we had library also every other week. Things that they have now, they didn't have then. It was unfortunate. Uh, but when you have to make tough decisions, when the Warren Committee goes to you and says, listen, you have to cut $500,000, you have to do what they tell you. You have to say, this is your budget. You have to turn in a budget with $500,000 less than what you have now. And a school committee member needs to make tough decisions about, it's not, it's not something you want to do, but it, as a leader on the committee, those are the things that you're there to do, to bring perspective to say, well, if we have to cut, where do we cut? And my feeling is that, um, this is how I put it. Last year when there were cuts, the same proposed cuts were to music and, um, which were music and art. And the other big thing that they bring up is that they would break the team approach at the middle school. Well, and they were gonna possibly lose a science teacher. My whole thing is in the community, as much as I love art and music in the schools, I can find art and music lessons for my children a lot easier than I can have them go into like a biochemistry lab and do that. So when you need to make tough decisions, it's not like it would be totally eliminated, but I, I, I find that the academics has to, has to come first because I don't think that the parent community can support those things for the children where in the arts they could. 
Lee Michael, uh, obviously Sheila and all of us. So Sorry. It, you, know, it, no, right. can, you can time me if you want. Uh, yeah. it, it, I, I should have mentioned again that if the answers are up to a minute. So, Lee Michael, sure. do you want to? Thanks for the opportunity, Bernie. Uh, I think Sheila makes some good points, and I'll just add to that that I think that the Milton Public Schools are great, and one of the reasons that they're great is that we offer so much in the way of extracurricular activities, in the way of elective courses, uh, a lot of those in art and music. And if we start nibbling away at the edges without planning in advance how to protect those programs, then we're going to start falling behind. And I want to make sure that Milton Public Schools maintain their edge and continue to improve. So I want to protect those programs. Thank you. Who's got the next question? I will. Um, how do you both feel about user fees um, right now? User fees seem to be going up constantly. And I do think they have great programs. But the cost to the parents and to the children is going up and up. <clears throat> yes, um, as someone who just paid three hundred dollars for my daughter to play spring tennis, um, mm -hmm. um, I know what you're talking about. But again, um, in in Milton, when you're faced with the budget cut, if you tell, if you go out to parents in the community and say that, um, you know, we're we're going to bring down athletic fees, but cut special ed. That's not, you know, again, tough decisions. That's not going to fly, right? So one of the things I would like to bring back, which I know uh, Kristen Bagley-Jones did for a long time, um, and I think one of the students last year tried to continue it, was um, the um, activities walkathon that they had, um, where, again, the kids in the community um, do a walkathon in the field house, and if they're sponsored, all of those fees bring down their user fees. I mean, again, you have to reach out to the community and do that. Mm -hmm. But I think that's something that if I get elected, I'd, I'd really like to bring back to help um, students to bring down the user fee. Another thing that I would like to see is that... Number uh, a minute. Okay, you, you, you can give me a time if you want. No, go ahead. I, okay. Um, time finish it. Um, that I'd like to see happen is um, that sometimes, you know, parent, if you reach out to other parents and you'd want to support a student in user fees, I see that a lot of the times in the community, that if... The parent, the parent community knows that it's going to a specific place more than a general fund. You know, we do that sometimes I'm on Pierce leadership, even things with the eighth grade social or the eighth grade field day. Those things cost money, but we have always, when we put out the permission slips and form, um, ask the community at large if they'd like to sponsor a student who maybe wouldn't have the fees to be able to participate in those really important activities. And I think bringing some, something like that up to the high school level um, you know, would be a good thing and, and maybe some way to curtail the fees because right now, as is, it's not going to be out of the budget. It just, it is what it is. That's the reality of it. Do you want to answer it, Lee, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> Sheila, I'm thinking that those school committee meetings might get a little longer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but excellent points. She makes a and lot of excellent points. Two of you will be elected. Yeah, there are, everybody has two votes. That's a great reminder. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bernie. Um, and I think that Sheila made a couple of great points. I love the idea of the walkathon and uh, students raising money. It's, it's a tough question, and I don't think that it's fair when you're talking about elective choices for students to make. We want them to be well-rounded. We want them to have the athletics. We want them to have um, art and, and theater after school. We want them to have all sorts of activities. But if, if everybody isn't participating, you don't want to be subsidizing those costs on the backs of all of the taxpayers. So I think that there needs to be some sort of a user fee for the users. I don't think it can be prohibitively expensive, and I don't think that we should forget about the students who can't afford those fees, and we need to have some need-based scholarships, and as Sheila mentioned, fundraising and sponsorships. Because uh, I, I, like I mentioned earlier, I want Milton Public Schools to continue to offer the excellent number of services that we have. Who would like to ask the next question? In view of the snowy winter this past winter, should there be an odd year, school year? Should we start planning for that? I think it is it to Thank me. You. Thanks, Sheila. <clears throat> Should we have an all-year school year? I think that that question needs to be answered at a national level, or at least at a Commonwealth level. Um, as a teacher, uh, as a as a 
a hoped for teacher when I was younger. I was really looking forward to those summers off. So I don't know if everybody would love that change. I think that there is a lot built around the school year right now that would need to change. That's a monumental change. Um, and uh, in terms of the snowy winter this year, I think that this was a very unusual year. And I think we need to keep that in perspective before we start making drastic changes. Um, I think that the superintendent handled uh, the snowy winter very well. And I think that we're getting out in June per the teacher contract, which is very good compared to what some of the other communities around us are dealing with. So it was a difficult year. I think we handled it well. The superintendent is proposing some changes for next year in terms of two additional days um, so that we can have additional protection <coughs> to protect us against these once in 100 year storms, which are coming a little faster than 100 years, of course. But um, again, I think that we're managing well right now. Um, a year-round year school might be an interesting solution, but not something that I know enough about or I think anybody knows enough about for us to endorse at this moment. So when you say year-round, you mean through July and August? Yeah. No, I do not propose that. Um, no vacation for the family. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well um, but just as a parent of a high schooler and um, a middle schooler, you know, kids, kids today and the curriculum today, it is so much more intense than when I was there and probably than when you were there. You'd be, it would be unbelievable to see what kids are reading in third grade now, what I was reading curriculum-wise in sixth grade. They are under uh, a ton of pressure, it's something I worry about. I know that the CPAC committee actually is having a great speaker tomorrow night at Pierce about anxiety in children today because it is huge and there is no way that I would want to bring that on kids that they would have to <laughs> that you have to tell them that they have to go to school in July and August I don't see it would be where it would have any benefit I think the kids would tune out and if anything it would be de detrimental to their overall education <coughs> so no. Thank you. Pat's got a question I think yeah I'd like to know how you both feel about this year's override this year's override is for the medical um, needs of a former firefighter. Uh, first, yeah, um, just like uh, the two candidates for selectmen, um, again, I've been a town meeting member for 10 years and I followed this situation uh, when Mr. Pickens' um, accident occurred and we've been um, kept abreast uh, in town meeting of the situation about his health costs. You know, we, we have to do it because um, you know, here's a man who's a firefighter for our town who, again, was going out to help um, a, a citizen, a pedestrian, and then, you know, gets hit, hit and severely, severely injured. So I don't know um, how you can say no to it. I think it's a good thing that they're putting together a committee to educate because in order to get an override pass, you have to educate. And once people understand the given circumstances, um, I would hope that they would vote to support him because he deserves that. So I don't see how anyone could say he doesn't. He might help. Thanks. I support firefighter Pickens, therefore I support the override. I don't think it's even an option to not support the override given what the Department of Revenue has told us about how you need to be spending your money on medical bills. These are not unexpected costs. These are expected costs, and we need to be planning for them accordingly. We've been holding up a significant portion of our budget for the last couple of years and not spending that money on other things because we've been trying to anticipate costs and use one-time funds. Uh, that's not the way that we are supposed to be dealing with this problem, and that's not the way that I think we should be dealing with the problem. So I'm, I'm grateful that the override is on the ballot so that we can fix it. Uh, and like I said, I don't think it's really an optional vote. I think everybody should support Firefighter Pickens, and I think everybody should support the override. I understand that we do have insurance now if this happens again with, with a fireman or a policeman. So. Who's next? Uh, uh, 0286, my time matters. Teachers across the common, I don't know if it's, it's a local issue, but teachers across the Commonwealth have been critical about the amount of testing that they're being asked to perform. And the argument is that the testing takes away from teaching time and what teaching time there is is directed toward the test. Is there any, do you believe or think that at some point we should revisit the amount of testing that's taking place here? Well, again, I think that a lot of the testing 
that is taking place is either mandated by the Commonwealth or mandated by the federal government. So I think it's difficult for us on a local town level to say that we're not going to participate in some test. Uh, a lot of funding is tied to those tests. There are obviously um, a lot of qualifications uh, that we need to meet uh, in order to get some of that funding. And I think that uh, the community at large wants to know how our students are doing and how our schools are doing. And I think standardized testing, although I'm not a fan of standardized tests and I am not a good test taker myself, um, I, I think standardized tests serve their purpose. I think that they're a necessary part um, of the curriculum. I think that there's too much time spent on them. Your question was, is there too much time? I think that uh, there is a reason why, as Sheila mentioned earlier, we're having a workshop coming up on uh, students and stress. Uh, and I think that maybe we need to look at ways to better prepare our students for the amount of testing that they need to take. Uh, and I'm all for looking at, at those numbers and seeing if we can decrease them. My guess is that our good administration and good school committee has already thought about that and has it to the bare minimum. But if we can, make, if we can cut back on that testing, I'm on support of that. Jim. Yeah, I agree with Lee Michael that the, the, the testing in Common Core is a national issue. It's, Milton School Committee can't change that. And I think that the parents of the town need to understand that um, if they feel that the kids are tested too much. But um, like Lee said, there's a lot of funding tested to it. You know, I work in educational publishing. I work for Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And um, I deal with um, standards. Uh, there's the Common Core standards and then there's still state standards that each DOE uh, also writes and wants their children to adhere to um, in their state. So there is a level where you do need like um, uh, a playing field to, to see how, how the national students across the board are doing. And that's what Common Core serves. I think that the pressures um, that the teachers feel and then trickles down to the parents, then trickles down to the students. You know, and the superintendents also feel it. You know, it's a little bit like uh, college, like college football. You know, what are your stats? How good, how good, is, your, how good is your system? So it, it's that pressure. I, I, I don't think it's a, um, a bad thing to give it. I think that the pressure to prove, it's almost like why the kids have anxiety. They, well, my school system does the best on MCATs, or now it'll be Park um, slash Common Core. I think I think it's good to have it. I just think that um, the atmosphere of maybe how it's administered could um, be a, be less stressful to both, again, the superintendent, to the principals, to the teachers and the students. That's why teachers feel um, like they they have to teach to the test. They feel their job is you know being viewed. How good are my math kids? course. How will my kids do in English? So, um, but, but I agree with you, Michael, that there's, there's a place for standardized testing. I too didn't like it. You know, as a kid, I remember the California achievement test with the number two pencil and you have 10 minutes and the clock seemed to tick louder and you could, you know, start sweating at it and that kind of thing. But kids today, I don't, my son just took the park today at Pierce electronically. It's the first time they administered it. I asked him about it tonight before I came over how it went. Um, he said it was different. He didn't say it was overwhelming. He said it was different because they have ear, earbuds in, they do everything electronically. Um, I think we need to give it time before we totally condemn it. You know, people don't like change, that's true, but I think we have to um, see where the park testing goes. We're one of the first uh, communities in the state who are doing it. So it is a little overwhelming, I think, on the principals um, and the sup superintendent and maybe the administration, but. I don't think we should totally condemn it. I think that the attitude of how we present it needs to be um, changed. Maybe it'll sense. take a little time. Sure, thanks Bernie. It's gonna be long school committee meetings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, just one more word about the setting the stage. Uh, if you tell the students that it's a big bad test, it's gonna sound stressful to them. And if you tell the students that 
this is part of the lesson plan, and once we complete this test, we're going to move on to the next thing. If, if you make it more part of the environment and you decrease the amount of stress around it, I think that there's a way to make the test easier for everybody. And um, if, like I said, if there are ways to decrease the amount of testing that we have going on, I'd, I'm more than willing to look at that. My assumption is that we have it as, as low as we can get it, and I think that we should work with what we have and make sure that it's as stress-free as possible and that the students are looking forward to, uh, to proving their skills rather than getting anxiety about it. And I just have one follow-up to that, that the anti-testing movement in a lot of people who sometimes choose private school because they say, well, we don't have, to, our kids won't be stressed out by the test and won't have to take the test. Most private schools in this area, they look at those MCATs before they let you in. So what does that say? Think about that. So. Well, residency has long been an issue in <coughs> Milton schools. Um, the school committee has gotten involved in it in different times. <coughs> Sometimes the police department has been responsible for checking out residency. Other times it's a school department employee. You know, how do you think this should be handled? And should the school committee think about tuitioning in some students from out of town. Okay, that, that, I'm, glad, I'm really glad that you asked that question, Pat. So this is an issue that's come up. I'm you know, a member of the Pierce Middle School PTO leadership. Um, and this is something that we uh, brought up to Mary Gormley this year because Mary Gormley meets with all the, the heads of each school monthly, so the four elementaries, the middle, and the high school. And residency came up um, because it's always something. Um, that people are concerned about. How much is it costing per pupil for our town? So when you try, when you go to register your child for kindergarten in this town, it's like, um, I don't know, it's like applying to work for the CIA. I mean, you have to, you have to really prove, you know, every, that you've been a resident, you know, all the documentation. And that's where it ends. So we at Pierce, I want to say, yay Pierce, but we at the Pierce PTO brought up that um, that they now will be that all students will have to re-display um, the parents' residency upon the entrance of Pierce Middle School and then again at the beginning of Milton High Public. And they'll have to be viewed just like they did at the beginning of kindergarten. And I think that's going to be a, uh, a very, I mean, administratively, you know, it's going to take time for them to all too, but it's going to cut down on a whole heck of a lot of um, people who are sliding in <clears throat> and who are not residencies, wh residents when they have to prove it uh, with concrete evidence. I think another reason that happened with, uh, the reason why we thought of that too is so much is going green so that you know um, all the communication between the schools and the parents are done through email. So if you have the same email that you did when your kid was a kindergartner as you do when they're entering Pierce in the middle school, and you move out, who knows, you know? So um, that's going to be a big change in the fall and that's happening. Uh, Mary Gormley confirmed that. So I was really happy to, um, to have the, the peer school bring that on the table for the system all, um, all around. And um, as far as bringing students in, I know that sometimes um, that could, you know, again, if it's not too much on the system as far as space goes, I know that sometimes we bring certain students in for, say, uh, special ed programs that aren't provided um, in their town, and if they pay, um, sometimes that funding that they pay us to service their students, if it's not going to impede too much class-wise size, um, can be a way to get money for the school. So it's something to consider. Do you want to comment, Dave Michael? Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> Good question. Um, I think the residency is uh, an issue that we need to constantly be looking at, as we are constantly lo being looking at it. I think it's a, a being solved problem. Some people consider it a growing problem, and, and I think that uh, you know we have a lot of resources right now that are devoted to making sure that all the students going to our schools uh, live in the town of Milton. And I think that Sheila's suggestion is a good one, that, that we look at reestablishing uh, residency at the beginning of the, a move to any new school. I think that that makes sense. There's a lot of towns um, that require it every year. When you, when you begin the school year. I don't know that we need to go to that, but I think that it makes sense when you move to a new school that, that you show you proof of residency. I think that that would take some of the burden off of the people right now who are trying to make those checks to make sure that um, students are living in town. To your question about um, 
tuitioning in students. That happens right now to a limited extent. In fact, Mary Kelly was able to find some funding uh, from private tuition student in order to um, replace the number one budget priority cut that the school committee had to make, which was restructuring STEP. She was able to find $45,000 from a private tuition in order to um, replace that priority. So uh, that is happening, and maybe there is an opportunity to, um, to increase that. Dave has a, has a question. Dave the French immersion program comes up from time to time. And before I ask my question, <laughs> I want to tell you, I'm partly French. I'm minored in French. I have lived in France. I still go to events that you know, require my French. But nobody is going to get a job using French. Now, other schools like the Academy of the Pacific Rim in Hyde Park have Chinese immersion. Isn't it time to think about offering a more practical language to emphasize, emphasizing a more practical language? Oh, aren't you lucky? <laughs> uh, is it time to look at another language? I think it's always time to look at another language. I think we sh there should be an ongoing conversation. It comes up every time there's a, a race for school committee. It comes up when there isn't a race for school committee and you know, the other times of the year. Uh, I think that the French immersion program uh, has been an asset for the town of Milton. I think people move here not because of the number of restaurants we have, but because of French immersion in our schools. So I'm, uh, I'm a supporter of the program. I'm a supporter of also making sure that our English program is as strong or stronger, which is why I'm really, really happy about the STEM immersion <laughs> program that the schools are putting in place now. I think it's an amazing uh, asset uh, to our schools, and I can't wait to see it grow uh, and be offered in all grades. Um, I, I, I believe that we have two strong options in our schools right now, and that is something that a lot of towns are envious of. So I want to make sure that we retain that individuality and, and that we're able to offer those two options. In terms of the, of the specific language, I think that we have a long history with French, and I think that uh, children have an aptitude for learning languages when they're young. Uh, we have electives for other languages in high school where you can pick up some of these other languages that you're talking about and get fairly fluent in them, as I did with Spanish when I was in high school. So those options exist. Um, so I, I'm fine having a conversation about looking at another language, but I want to make sure that we retain the, the, um, the language immersion program because I think it's a strong asset for Milton. Sheila, a minute to... Yeah, um, so I, I too um, agree that people move here for the French immersion. I mean, people buy their homes because of the immersion language that we teach. And French has been here for probably over 25 years now. Um, and I think that what happens um, when people say, well, why, why don't you change the language and why don't you totally restructure it and pick Chinese or things like that? I do think uh, that would be very cumbersome at the moment on the system. And I think that after so many years of having the dual tracks, um, especially under the helm of Mary Gormley right now, uh, it's, it's in a good place. Um, it is um, maintained financially as best as it could be with the, the, the staffing. And, and not only just the immersion, you know, if you do the STEM, you start Spanish in first and second grade, and then it increases as you go up. And friends of mine who have done the English track, and their kids are either Spanish or Latin, or some kids, after they do French immersion and they go up to Pierce, they decide they don't want to do it anymore, and they switch over to Latin or Spanish. In general, Milton Public Schools, foreign language, that and their music department are so above and top-notch other public schools in this state, can't even compare. <coughs> Yesterday, my friend and co-PTO um, leadership member, Karen Viveros, was saying, you know, they have relatives in Canton, Braintree, Westwood. Again, her kids are English track, three kids. Some do Spanish, some do Latin. They're just so far advanced in foreign languages in general. And uh, kids who really pick up Spanish, who do the Spanish program, they're in AP Spanish by the time they're, you know, a sophomore and fluent by the time they leave. So I just think in general, the foreign languages, even though French is the immersion track, the other two languages are unbelievable. You can ask any parent who has kids in Latin or Spanish. So um, I, I wouldn't change that because I think that um, they're part of like the stellar cachet of this public school system. Frank, a uh, uh, pass? Uh, of the issues that have come up 
so far, you seem to be fully behind, endorse, and support the schools. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would work on or change or look to innovate with? <clears throat> I'm first this time. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think an area um, that, that I think needs um, re-examination, and, and I do know that uh, Mary and her team are doing this, um, is special education. I think that that's always an area um, that needs to be re-examined. There's so many uh, levels of special ed in the public schools now, and and they. I was glad to hear, because when I spoke with um, the heads of the department, that they are doing a full reevaluation here um, to see how they manage it, how, uh, you know, budgetary-wise, you know, um, how they administer it, how they set up the classrooms and where they put it. Um, special ed has a lot of mandates that you just, it, that you have to provide for students. Um, it's very costly. And I think that um, examining it and making sure that that every student at whatever level of special ed they're in, whatever, whatever part of the spectrum they may be on, um, that it's met and that, that the, the director of special ed has good communication with CPAC's, CPAC parents. Um, I feel like that, that it's getting better, but that's definitely an area of the schools um, when I talk to parents of special ed students that um, could, be, could, could improve. Definitely. Just, just let me voice. CPAC is the Special Ed Parent Advisory Committee, yes, I believe. Just yes, for who, people yeah, who may for not. people don't know. Yeah. So it's it is it's the it's the parent group, um, who the advisory committee for students with special ed in the Milton Public Schools. They um, they are very strong advocates. They have a very strong voice. They're very well organized, and um, I think that working. I, I know that they that the school works with them. Um, Fairly well now, but I think that um, yeah, special. I, I know I, I I've spoken to Mary about that, um, just from the voice that I get amongst my Pierce Middle School um, parents, and then other kids, the, the other parents I know of kids in elementary, and I was very happy to hear that this big um, reevaluation. They have a grant that's going to pay for um, a complete reevaluation of how it's structured, maintained. So I think that's a really good thing. So thank you, Frank, for clarifying that. Um, yeah, I have a question about budget. I think I need to answer yeah. Frank's question. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thanks. <clears throat> Frank, thanks for the opportunity to get a little creative with the answers. It's a, it's a question that I appreciate, and uh, I appreciate a lot of Sheila's points as well. I want to take us in a little bit of a different question, uh, direction. I have a, a Facebook page that I've been using to reach out to members of the community, and I've been bouncing my ideas off of folks. And one of the... Um, things that I've been discussing that seems to be really resonating uh, with the people of Milton is uh, the participation of girls in our STEM program and the progression of girls uh, throughout high school and women into college in STEM. And uh, some statistics that have really blown my mind uh, include 74% of girls express interest in STEM in middle school. And when those same girls go off to college, only 0.3% of them go into computer science. That's a sea change from interest to following through. Um, in fact, if you look at the number of women going into computer science, there are less women going into computer science now than there were in the 1970s. Shocking. So I think that Milton Public Schools, uh, in addition to all of the metrics that they're looking at in their diversity report right now, should look at the role of uh, young women in our STEM program and should encourage them to follow their strengths and their dreams through high school and onto the college level. There was, a, uh, there was a meeting at the White House today on women in STEM and uh, there were a lot of points made about the number of lucrative jobs that exist and how the pay differential between men and women is actually smaller in the STEM uh, industry than it is in many other industries. So there's an opportunity for women to earn more in STEM, and uh, there's an opportunity for us to really diversify the number of people that we have working in science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, because I think that the greatest solutions to any problems come from having the most diverse number of people uh, working on those problems, and you can't have diversity without women in the mix. So I want to encourage more girls to follow their dreams and stay in STEM, and I think that there's a role there for the Milton Public Schools. Do we have any more questions, or do we want to go into the final? 
Can I just ask you to, because you have some great ideas, how you can do that and stay on budget? Because you're only allowed to go up two and a half percent. Are you saying that you've got to have constant overrides, or are you saying it's possible to do it on budget? Who's first? Not constant overrides, yeah. Pat. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't believe that we need constant overrides. But I also don't think that the purpose of Prop Two and a Half was to live within two and a half percent for eternity. It was to make sure that the voters had a um, consistent voice in when uh, services were going to go up or when uh, taxes were going to go up. If the town really wants services to stay exactly the way that they are, then they can vote down those proposition overrides. However, I think that the um, operational overrides that Milton has had have been smart, and I think it's time for for another one, and I, the Warren Committee, the Board of Selectmen, and the School Committee have all signed off on that two-year plan. So the town is going to see that coming next year. And I think that the way you pay for that is you have a three-year strategic plan and you have a five-year strategic plan. And you know in advance what you want to be spending your money on, and you plan accordingly so that those overrides aren't a surprise to anybody and that you have a well-thought-out and well-planned budget. Um, I think that there is money to do these exciting things. I don't think that encouraging girls to get involved in STEM is going to be all that expensive. We have an excellent STEM program that's starting right now, and I think that there are ways to make sure that um, girls stick with that uh, without spending a ton of money. But I think proper financial management is uh, the answer to your question. Sheila, you've got up to three minutes in your... In your uh, well, I, I think I have to answer Pat's question No, you, first. you can answer it in your three minutes because there's many more people here that... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to answer the, um, yeah. the question on... Yeah. And on, you get yeah. up to three minutes to do it. Yeah. Do it. Um, and then Lee Michael can chime in. No, again. no, I'm going to answer her question on STEM first, and then, I, and then the closing statements happen after that. Correct? Am sure, yep. Um, um, no, I agree. I, the, the STEM program, like, like Lee Michael said, <clears throat> it's, it's getting more aggressive, even when you look at the numbers next year, believe it or not. Um, at Cunningham, there's going to be three English tracks, which they are now called the STEM tracks, and only one French. And I think that's because parents in general, I think the STEM, um, you know, p young parents are looking, you know, where are the jobs, where is the training? I know they're only entering first grade, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but it is Milton then. Um, and so um, STEM is something that they, they want their kids to have, and it's a... Uh, the program's doing well. It's going to continue to grow. I don't think uh, to bring more STEM education uh, into that English track now, um, and they have STEM programs at Pierce now, is going to really cost the system more money. Um, wouldn't, it wouldn't mean that you need an override to have STEM in the schools. Um, but um, it's just more, it's just, bring, it's just fine tuning the curriculum, bringing more intel from the outside about what kind of STEM programs you can, you can teach both at the elementary and the middle school, and then when the kids go up to high school, however they apply it. Um, so I don't, I don't think that that's a problem. And as far as the override goes, um, I too, you know, with how everything is planned out, there will, be an, there will be an operational override next year for all the town utilities. Um, and it will be eight years since the last operational override. I think that shows pretty good fiscal responsibility, personally. So. Um, the problem, the problem with it is that people need to be educated. When people buy their house here and young parents come around, they don't say, how does your town government ru run and, you know, uh, what's, what is Proposition 2 and a half? They don't, they don't ask that. They say, how's your school system? Um, so I advocate all the time for young families to maybe run for town meeting, maybe educate themselves about how our town uh, government runs from the selectmen to the town meeting members, et cetera, et cetera who the Warren Committee is, how the, they control the budget. I think education is key to everything, um, but, and I know we're all busy. I work full time, I have two, you know, I would say young kids, I guess middle school, high school kids now. Um, I know it's hard, but you, you, have to, you have to educate yourself about the needs of your town. And in a town that only has 2.8% commercial tax base, operational overrides once every eight years is not, I don't think, too much to ask if it's planned out and done correctly. Lee, Michael, do you want to take a minute? And uh, do you want Sheila to go into her final three minutes? Uh, no, I'm fine. Why don't, you, why don't you make your closing statement, and then I'll make mine. Thank okay. you. That's fine. Um, so uh, for people who don't know me in town, my name is Sheila egan Farella, and I've been a resident for 14 years here. I have two <coughs> children, a son, Miguel, who is a sixth grader at Pierce, and a daughter who's a freshman at the high school. Uh, both my husband and I have been involved in um, 
the town community and town leadership and town politics since uh, my grace was probably three years old. Um, I served, as far as the schools go, um, a Collicott Site Council. I've been chair of their cultural committee. Um, I organized uh, and was one of the founders of their One Book, One School Committee. Um, I spent six years as uh, a faith formation teacher at St. Angus's Church. Um, I am currently employed and have been in, um, in educational publishing for 20 years at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. So I work on pre-K through 12 books every day about curriculum. Um, I have a good <coughs> understanding of what's going on curriculum-wise um, in today's, uh, today's educational world. And I also am a teacher. I have taught dance uh, here at, uh, it used to be in Milton, but now it's over in Quincy at InSync Center of the Arts for a little over 10 years now, and I've taught a lot of the kids in the Milton communities. And uh, even though I'm not teaching algebra equations I, and, and I'm teaching people how to uh, do a triple time step, I do know what it's like to have to um, teach kids, get through to kids, um, understand them, read them, um, you know, find out what their wants are, what, what, what's needed to, to make them feel good about themselves. And I think I can connect with that. So um, I think I bring a lot of knowledge about the schools. And I have um, a knowledge about educational curriculum. Um, I'm a teacher myself and have been, like I said, over 10 years. Um, and if elected, I think one of the things I have, even for the current members there, and I respect all of them that are there, um, I'll be the only one that has been through the elementary um, and has somebody in the schools now at the middle and the high school. And I think when tough decisions need to be made, the experience of um, assessing the needs of all the schools, elementary, Pierce, and high school, with a real hands-on voice um, will be a big um, addition to the current school committee. So I hope I can count on your vote on the 28th, one of your two choices. And I want to thank you all for hosting and asking such good questions tonight. Thank you very much. Your turn, Lee Michael. <laughs> Up to three minutes. <clears throat> Thanks, Bernie. And, and I think what we're going to do, I think we're going to take the library trustees because Andrea Gordon has come out of a sick bed. And so that's. <laughs> Thanks, Bernie. And thanks, everybody, for hosting us. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk directly uh, with you and have the voters see uh, our ideas. Again, I'm Lee Michael McLean, and I'm a candidate for school committee. I think Milton Public Schools are amazing. They are the reason why I want to raise my son, Simon, here. Um, and I want to keep a good thing going. Uh, we have highly desirable art and music programs. We have fantastic athletic choices. We have robust AP classes, a great strategy for rolling out STEM to our entire school system. Uh, but you ask any great organization how they stay great, and they'll tell you that they're constantly improving. Uh, and we have some areas where we need to work. Our SAT scores are average. Uh, and we have some performance gaps within several demographic groups in our students. We have participation gaps in athletics, and we unfortunately are cutting teachers this year. I want to work on all of these things. I have the experience and motivation to be a valuable member of the school committee. I am committed to education, so much so that I went back to school at night to earn my master's degree in international finance. I am committed to equality. Uh, one example of that uh, is my work through my company, which is a Dallas-based not-for-profit hospital uh, cooperative. Uh, my work in that company on their diversity council. I'm a founding member of that council, and I fought there hard for transparency in employment demographics and more inclusive hiring pools to areas where we have made significant progress. I have finance and budgetary expertise as a director of business development, and also I have performance improvement expertise, uh, including a Six Sigma green belt in process improvement, and I've worked on countless cost reduction and performance improvement initiatives. I'd like to bring that expertise to Milton. Uh, I've completed a student teaching practicum at Waltham High School, teaching English to 9th and 12th grade students, and I completed the teacher certification program at Brandeis University. I'm a current member of the Warrant Committee, and I'm a town meeting member, uh, with an excellent appreciation for our town's budget process and competing budget needs. I have a vested interest in our town, as I mentioned. Uh, I'm quickly about to be a consumer of our school district, and I want to get involved for my son, Simon. Uh, for more information on any of uh, my ideas or to reach out to me directly, um, check out my website, leemichaelformilton.com, or look for me on Facebook, uh, also Lee Michael for Milton, uh, or come out and see me in person. I'm having a campaign kickoff event on March 29th at the Alexander Forbes House. 
Uh, I hope that you will entrust me with one of your two votes for school committee on April 28th. Again, I'm Lee Michael McLean, and I'll be a strong advocate for students, for teachers, and for you. Thanks very much. I, 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 I also forgot my website, sheilaforschools.org. <laughs> Number four, so just uh, visit it too. All my info is there. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Sheila. Thanks, Michael. 28th of April. Yep. The big Get day. out the vote. vote Get out the thrill. vote. You start off here. Yes. What the first question? Who wants to ask the first question? Too bad Frank didn't sit here, but hmm? there's a little conflict, maybe. Um, well, he's on your board. I'd like to ask about parking at the library hmm. and whether there's any plan to expand that parking and how other people who aren't on the library trustees right now think about expanding the parking. Yes, thank you, Pat. That's a, that's a great question that's been ongoing for uh, many years. I'm uh, running for re-election for the, uh, the Board of Trustees of the library, and uh, it was a topic that uh, our very first meeting discussed that very issue. We have been making uh, progress. Um, as you may know, there have been additional parking spaces added along uh, uh, one side of the library, and uh, that we've reversed the entrance and exit of the library. And there are additional plans. We're looking into the possibility of uh, uh, expanding the uh, land for parking and also for creating a turnaround uh, within our parking uh, lot as it currently exists. It is a big problem, and with the number of programs that we have and are uh, continuing and want to promote, uh, it's gonna be a continuing problem unless uh, we do something about it. I've already contacted Senator Brian Joyce and made him aware of the situation, and hopefully we'll see some, from help, some help coming from the, from the state in dealing with this. The next question is, is for uh, Paul Hayes. Same question? Uh, sure. No. Okay. No? Yeah. Should we no. all answer the same sure. question? No. Yes. Wait, no, we don't do that. This, no, we don't do it that way because oh. uh, you can answer it, but it's going to be on your time on another question. Be hmm. So, do you have a question for? No. I'll give another question, Pat. I, I, I had a question. When I wrote about the library for the record transcript when it was opening, I asked if it was going to be the search engines on the computers would be filtered, filtering out pornography, and they said no, because it would limit the search capabilities. And I wanted to know how that was going, and just again to say that as a Marshfield resident, Marshfield filters for computer, I'm a heavy library user, I mean for pornography on the computers, and it has never, I've never even noticed that there was a filter. I was invited once to a gun show, and I couldn't open that, it filtered for that, but it said, you know, if you have a problem, see the librarian. But otherwise, it was I never even noticed. So how is that working in Milton, the open search? That would be for Paul. I'll jump in on that. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I'm asking everybody but you. My I'm first uh, first question on Milton Access Television about pornography. Uh, jump right in. <laughs> uh, my, my name is uh, Paul Hayes, and I'm running for election uh, as a member of the trustees. I'm a proud 13-year uh, 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 resident of Milton, and I uh, watch uh, Matt, uh, Milton Access Television, late at night often, so it's very honored to be here and uh, be here with Bernie Lynch uh, moderating. I feel like I finally arrived in Milton now that I get to sit across from uh, Bernie Lynch. Um, I am uh, an administrator for 20 years now in public education, and I am an uh, assistant superintendent. I'm a chief academic officer of three high schools here in Massachusetts. I oversee three high schools with three principals, with uh, over 500 students and uh, with over 150 faculty and staff, uh, three buildings of 75,000 square feet, and we have over 300 computers and, and uh, multiple servers that run those buildings. And we have extensive firewalls and servers on them, uh, server filters on them, that ensure that there is uh, no pornography or nothing that students shouldn't be looking at on them, and it doesn't slow down productivity uh, during the day, so it can be done. So uh, as a trustee member, I'll be sure to help uh, make sure that that is the case, that we shouldn't uh, uh, have any uh, slowing down of our internet, but make sure that everything on our internet is what we want our uh, tax-paying residents to be viewing, especially our teens. Thanks. Well, Andrea gets the next question. You can answer that, Andrea, unless you want another. Well, I, I um, really would like to learn more about the filters that are available out there before you know I support any one, are, are adopting any one filter. They're probably and you can probably answer this, there probably are filters on the children's computers in, at the library. Um, I do know that 
so, some filters really do interfere with your, your, your research. Um, if you just put in the word breast, for instance, you're not going to come up with, you, you might be you know, blocked from lots of websites yeah. because of that particular filter. Right. So I think this is also a, a question that the whole board would have to look into, and I'm sure that the, uh, if the director of the library were here right now, he could answer that question. Um, very. It's been, um, it's been going okay. Quickly. Pardon? The policy. It's been going all right. That was. The the po well I the po I. In the three years that I've served on the board, this has never been raised as an issue. Oh, no one right. has ever raised this as an issue. No, I think I think there is a kind of. Welcome to Milton. I think there is a kind of filter, that they, they that comes that they have. I'm not sure though. You'd have to ask the. Uh, we'd have to ask the director, but it is something definitely that. I, I would be very much interested in pursuing if elected as you know one of the three trustees. Doug, do you want to be alone with Joe with sure. talking about sex? Sure. Uh, Doug Seibeck, uh, again, running for uh, the board of the trustees of the Milton Library. Um, I know that there are programs out there that can be very restrictive. There are security settings just on the computer alone that can, uh, as you were saying, if you type in the word breast, you wouldn't necessarily be able to even access, uh, say, like breast cancer awareness mm -hmm. simply because of the word. But there are now programs that can be a little bit more intuitive and help safeguard our children so that there's yeah. less um, uh, sort of innocent mistakes happening in the library so people aren't exposed to material that the library might not want exposed in public so much. Um, I don't really view it too much as a First Amendment right because, I mean, it's public. Uh, there are other options or other venues for people to do any type of research that, you know, of that nature that they want. But um, the programs that they have, I would support uh, being able to protect the public, and I'm sure the library can well accommodate it. Thank you. Do you have a question, Pam? Sure. I'd like to ask what the library needs to focus on. Um, it's been doing very well, and um, is there something special? And I'd really like you all to answer this one. You know, mm -hmm. is, is there something different that, that they should be doing that isn't being done now? Should I take that first? Sure. All right, fine. Uh, I think that the library is doing very well, and uh, there's a constant discussion at the board about the, um, the relevance of electronic media and uh, the role that that's going to be playing in the future. But my particular interest is uh, having the library, as the, the community gem that it is, uh, provide a service to the citizens of Milton with regard to providing a technology petting zoo. This was something that uh, I had uh, suggested three years ago when I was running. Uh, it is something that the Milton Foundation for Education, of which I'm a past president, has um, uh, already raised funds for, but it's sort of slow in being implemented. And it's not for any particular reason except perhaps that it takes time to integrate such a novel concept into the library. In particular, I would love to see a, a 3D printer or printers in our library. That is something that uh, is, it, it, uh, it's, it's a very provocative technology. Uh, it is uh, being used. We have one in our public schools already, and I'd like to see that available to the citizens of Milton. Mm -hmm. Just go back down, be okay. you are gonna answer this. Yeah, well, I think that um, I would like to see more programming for the teens in the community. We do have a certain amount of programming now for them, and it's very successful, but we don't have a, a staff member who is a, a full-time teen librarian or, or young adult librarian. And um, so that is really necessary, a, a, a full-time young adult services librarian, librarian is necessary to develop these programs, and that's very time-consuming. And we only, I don't think we tap all the children in the teens that are, could come to and really benefit from the library programs. And we do have a, a group that uh, belong to the teen club and teen book club at the library. But um, there is a staffing problem uh, 
for the, this particular age group. So I would really work hard to see if we can in, get, get some increased hours for a teen librarian at our library. Paul? I think there's several things that we can be working on over the next five years uh, at the Milton Library. Uh, number one, it's time to uh, update and streamline our web page. Uh, the web page has a lot of information on it, uh, but it's really only for those who know how to work web pages well. Uh, it needs to be uh, more mm -hmm. conducive to allow all uh, members uh, of the Milton community to be able to access it and use it uh, well to not just access mm -hmm. Milton's library, but all the libraries uh, of the area. Um, also, the, the teen um, uh, demand is not just in programming, but also in managing of the teens when they're in the library. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're very blessed uh, this last uh, uh, few years, as the, once the library was renovated, the volume of teens going to the library. Uh, but of course, we have to manage them. And, uh, and as they come to the library, make sure that their time is productive and that they feel welcome. They have opportunity for programming, but that they also uh, are uh, uh, maximizing their time there uh, productively. Uh, third, we've had over 230,000 folks attend the library last year. <coughs> in one year. That's the highest uh, ever. Uh, but I think we all know that. <coughs> I think we all know that the diversity of the folks who are attending our library doesn't reflect the diversity of the town of Milton. So I'd like us to work on increasing the programming and increasing the opportunity uh, for uh, those that are coming to the library to make sure that all neighborhoods are represented and all members feel welcome and attending the library. Well, there's a couple uh, priorities I think the library uh, could really choose to work on. Uh, one is, in general, as we were saying, the outreach to children, uh, making lifelong lovers of reading and appreciation of books and all the resources available in the library so that they're there to get them hooked for the rest of their life in there to get them young and get them in early is there's uh one person there who a children's librarian who makes the outreach to schools but when she's out in the schools getting the children interested she's not there servicing the children who are already in the library that day so there is more resources that could be hopefully devoted to it so that more children get into the library. And then there's the other practical concerns of like the parking, so that once you get the more people in there, mm -hmm. they can be serviced. <laughs> they, they are not feel uh, rejected or anything because there's no place to park or go into the library. So there are uh, a couple of big areas that the library can work on. Thank you. Pat has a general question for everyone. To... Yes, and um, I'm glad that, that something might happen about parking. Um, but I would mm -hmm. like, all of you to let us know what you think about this year's override. The override this year is for an accident that happened in 2009. Um, Antonio Pickens is still being treated um, as a result of that accident, this former firefighter. Um, and they want to put $500,000 on an override this year. Mm -hmm. Why don't you start this time? I, I'll start. I, I would support that very strongly because up till now we've been taking some money for him out of um, a special fund uh, and uh, that has taken away from other items in town that need money. So our other departments. Um, I, I think some of that money might have come from the stabilization fund, I'm not sure. Um, However, th this is long overdue, having this override, as Sheila Varola said. Um, it's the first time in eight years we're having an override, which is not very, um, you know, it's, it's uh, we, we've been very frugal in town. So I think the time has come to have this, and I do support it. Hi, personally, I'm going to vote for the override for all the reasons mentioned before by our, our selectman uh, debate earlier and our school council uh, debate. Uh, I think the main issue that uh, would affect us as trustees is the issue of money and making sure that there's sufficient money to run uh, the library mm -hmm. and the other uh, parts uh, of Milton. And uh, when it comes to the budget, we all know that the budget is reflected of our plan and the, the quality of our three and five year plan. And I'm in public education, and we uh, oversee an over $7 million budget annually. And we really uh, are down to the wire uh, every uh, June as we wait to find out what the per pupil is released for the upcoming year. And we've already mm -hmm. signed contracts and made budgets mm -hmm. uh, for the upcoming year, and we, the, the state still hasn't released the per pupil. So I know the difficulties of planning ahead and having a street to strategic plan while still having to work with the states to know what your numbers you're working mm -hmm. with and making sure it all pans out. But if you have a strong plan, 
and you have smart, caring people that are willing to put in the hours to help create those plans, that even when you come up against mm -hmm. financial difficulties, you can find a way to work together to make sure it works. If you don't have a good plan, then of course money won't help you. So it's, uh, that's what uh, I hope to uh, contribute as a, as a uh, trustee member with a family uh, uh, that are going to the public schools uh, in the conversations about the five-year plan for the uh, Milton Library. Well, um, the uh, the library trustees, as a board, are not likely to come up with this issue uh, recently. But as a Milton resident, uh, this is a very important one to me. Uh, I also I hold a master's of science degree in financial economics. So, um, economically speaking, it makes more sense to me to have the override and to support it rather than do something, say, borrowing to help cover the cost. There's a sacred trust between the first responders who service this town and put their lives in safety <coughs> on the line for us. And so as a town, uh, we have to uphold our end of that sacred trust and take care of them. <coughs> so it is very important that we actually uh, have this override and can meet our obligations. You're good to last on. Yes, I'd like to say that um, there's no question that we have to do the right thing. And uh, if this is the right thing, then yes, I will vote for it. Um, I have heard tonight that the expenses that are being incurred have been decreasing over the past several years, and that the estimate for this, or the, the amount for this year was about $200,000. I'd like to know why we're asking for $500,000, first of all, mm -hmm. and I'd also like to know if there's some sunset clause to this, or are we going to be forever right. paying uh, increased taxes, $57 a person or so, um, you know, after I'm long gone, for example. Will Milton residents continue to have to pay for this? I haven't had the opportunity. I don't even know if the warrant, uh, the article is uh, public domain yet. It's but no, I, it's I, no, that's why I am. It's new, yes, and I don't know whether, I certainly haven't read it, so I don't know the details, but those mm -hmm. are things that come to my mind. Mm -hmm. Sunset clause, and is $500,000 the appropriate amount? So let's see, now we're gonna go into the closing, and Douglas is the first, because mm -hmm. Your okay. name begins with S. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> uh, thank you. My name is Doug Zybeck, uh, resident of Milton. Uh, my grandparents <coughs> lived in here. My father was raised here. I myself am actually from Boston, uh, but oh, that shouldn't be held against me. I will actually, as other candidates have said, being better integrated into the community is doing something by participating, and this is which I wish to do, running for this office, uh, a writer, and I use the library very often, and so wish to actually support it, because it supports me, as well as support the community, which I am a now a proud resident of. And as I said, I am a uh, holder of a master's in science of financial economics, so I hope to bring that skill and education to help the board you know, with my uh, resources any way I can. I also hold a master's in psychology, so I can hope to navigate whatever tricky waters the board might have to uh, incur when we uh, meet. And so I do hope that I can earn one of your three votes on election day and serve the town as a member of the board of trustees for the Milton Library. I guess. Thank uh, you. Uh, Andrea. Um, and then. Okay, well, thank you very much for having this candidate's forum. And um, my name's Andrea Gordon, and I've. Um, my adopted town is Milton, originally from Boston, but I've lived in Milton for more than 50 years with my husband, Marvin, and my four daughters who went to Milton High School, and, um, uh, and my granddaughter who is about to go to Milton High School next year as a freshman. Uh, so I am a professional li librarian, retired. I was the school library director um, for Thayer Academy for many, many years. And um, I've been a town meeting member for, from Precinct 8 for many years. And I had been a library trustee from 1994 to 2012. And I decided I would uh, welcome a sabbatical. Um, I thought it was going to be a permanent sabbatical, but I really missed working for the library. I've been an advocate for our town library for years and years and years. I was a founder of the Milton Library, one of the founding members of the Milton Library Foundation, which raised the bulk of the money, uh, the private money for the uh, new library. 
and I just love being part of the library team. And several of the problems that existed when I finished in 2012, they're there now, like the parking and like the energy costs, which are, are, have gone you know, into the stratosphere. Uh, our electricity at the library is one of the uh, biggest expenses we have in our budget, and I'd like to see that reduced by uh, investigating the uh, possibility of having um, alternative energy sources like solar. Uh, so uh, I would really appreciate your considering me and uh, for one of your three votes. Um, I'm very dedicated to the library, and uh, I just would welcome getting back into the saddle. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Hayes, I guess, and then uh, Herb goes last. Thank you, Bernie. Again, my name is Paul Hayes, and I'm running for library trustee, uh, seeking election uh, first time uh, to the uh, Board of Trustees. And I'm a 13-year resident of Milton. 13 years ago, my wife and I, Peel, chose to come to Milton to raise our family. And it was a big choice that we made, but it was an easy choice. Uh, our uh, two kids, Max and Lucy, <coughs> Lucy in third grade and Max in fifth grade, are happy uh, students at <coughs> Tucker Elementary, and we're very proud to be raising our students in the public schools in Milton. And our students are in the French immersion program, uh, uh, just experiencing the blessings of all that Milton has to offer. Uh, our students are doing very well in Milton, um, but even despite the fact that they only get library services for about 45 minutes every other week as does every elementary uh, school student in Milton. And what has enabled our students to be above grade level literate in French and English is the supplemental materials they get from the children's section of the public library. And we all know what that public library, the children's section of the library looked like before 2009, that dark entrance around the side uh, before it was renovated in the beautiful space it is today with all the resources it is today. Uh, we are very thankful for what our students have, our, our kids have received from the library. Uh, and my wife serves as a public uh, uh, um, town meeting member and is also on the Milton uh, Foundation for Education. So I want to serve and give back to the town that's given uh, so much to me. And so I've chosen to, to run for library trustee to, to give back to the library that has given so much to me uh, and my children. Uh, I've gotten a lot of experience the last 20 years in public education as a teacher, as a principal, and now as a chief academic officer overseeing three high schools in Massachusetts. And I earned my doctorate at Boston University School of Education. And I was also um, a privilege to earn a fellowship uh, from the Lynch School of Education at Boston College to help uh, give me the experience and the knowledge to be an effective administrator, an effective educator. And I want to bring that uh, to the trustees uh, in Milton as I'm raising my family in Milton to, to give that voice of the, uh, the family that's uh, raising their kids in grade school and uh, looking to make the library even better. Uh, when I stand in line uh, at the library or when I'm with the families uh, at Tucker and we talk about the library, everyone talks about the incredible changes that Milton has gone through uh, since 2009 when the schools were renovated and the library was renovated. And often folks say, isn't it great how it is? I just, it's, it's, it's reached its point and it's, everything's going really well. Well, those of us that know uh, how important the future is know that, uh, that our organizations must continue to grow and evolve in order to continue to be effectively serving the community. And so as this is, the status quo is not enough. We have to have an effective three-year plan, effective five-year plan, and I'd like to be a part uh, of the future of Milton by serving the library to help uh, to construct that plan. Herb? Yes, so my name is Herb Boyd. I'm running for re-election to the uh, Board of Trustees of the Milton Library. And uh, I've got to tell you, I've enjoyed very much these past three years. It's been a very enjoyable uh, experience although the board only meets once per month, and I find that sometimes the pace is a little bit slow. But I'm busy with other things, so that's not such a big problem. It's just something that perhaps uh, we can deal with in the future. Um, <clears throat> in some circles of Milton, I'm known as Renit's husband, and uh, my wife and I have lived here since 1981 in uh, three different houses in Milton, and we made conscious decisions to stay within the town every time we were faced with uh, a choice of moving somewhere new. Um, we have two children, Justin uh, and Emily. Justin is married to a woman. Um, her name is Jennifer Langdon Voigt now. 
Uh, she went, attended the Von Bonn Academy, so she has ties to Milton as well. And they're raising their twins here. They bought a house in Milton as well, so we're very fortunate that, they are, uh, that, that they're here. My daughter Emily went to school in Milton until high school, and then she went to an all-girls school in Quincy um, because that was the right choice for her. My son went to all Milton Public Schools here before attending Boston University, where I'm a professor of biomedical engineering. And uh, I want to say that um, the library is really a gem of the community. It's a community center. It's becoming ever, ever more so as, uh, as time goes on. And we need to adjust. Uh, the, the library of the past is not the library of the future. And uh, that's one of the most challenging things I, I see in my role as trustee helping to develop the policies that will make sure that our library stands 100 years from now, you know, at least, and beyond. Um, the energy uh, consumption of our library is enormous. The electricity bill last year was $82,000, and it's projected to be $100,000 next year. Uh, last October, I brought to the board an option of perhaps putting solar panels onto the roof of the library. We actually had a company come. I made my way up onto the roof, uh, saw what was possible. They gave us a preliminary plan. As a result of the walk-on, they provided us with a secondary plan. And now that um, the process is going forward, I'm a little bit reluctant to push that right now, seeing what's happened to the solar panels you know, on town hall. But um, something's got to give. When I was driving into Boston just the other day, you know, I, there's still massive amounts of snow everywhere. But I noticed going down um, the Southeast Expressway that there are solar panels in that that were completely clear. The gas so, tanks, yeah. Uh, before right. that, yes. Uh -huh. So anyway, 22 seconds left. I love books. I love CDs, DVDs, audio books. I love the museum passes, and I get all of this for free. And that is something that's really, truly remarkable. And I get it because I have one of these, a Milton Library card. And this is also free. And every citizen of Milton should have this. In fact, I don't understand why my almost two-year-old twins' uh, granddaughters don't have one yet. I asked her, the mothers about that, but thank you. Okay. Well, the 28th of April, uh, you can vote for what, three? Yes. Yes. Thanks for coming. Thank, thank you for having us. And I want to thank the park people for, for letting these people come out. Two aspiring park commissioners. Uh, oh, the only question. Are you an attorney too? Believe it or not, they agreed to not to be questioned. <laughs> they they want to go directly into the into the closing. The closing. This this is great. So efficiency in government. Okay. <laughs> and you're hungry, aren't you? That's okay. So let's see. Neither one is an incumbent, and and Robert is uh, will be in the top of the ballot because of Kelly. So you go first, and Brian. Oh, of course you, you don't want. Well, how, how do you want to do it? What uh, what's the proposal here? Well, the, the top name on the ballot goes with the, with the first question, and then the, the last name on the ballot has uh, make closing remarks, but you people agreed and you signed it that, that sure, sure. you know, you want to do it this way, so... Let Bob go first? Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Bob Kelly. I'm a candidate for Park Commissioner. Uh, thank you to the uh, panelists, uh, the moderators, and the sponsors. It's been an interesting evening, and, and it's great to get uh, various feedback on all the different uh, races. Uh, I live on Franklin Street in East Milton with my wife and my daughter uh, in the heart of East Milton. Uh, um, and I'm uh, proud to live there. I'm proud to say I grew up in Milton. Uh, a lot of my family, the majority of my family lives in Milton. Uh, I'm a native who benefited from the excellent parks and recreation facilities that we have in this town. And I'm uh, delighted to be able to raise a family here. Uh, my daughter's two years old and I'm very often uh, at Andrews Park. And I have nine uh, nieces and nephews who live in the town. so. Uh, between attending some of their practices and games, I, I, I hit every park. And I'm glad to do it. I've always been a proponent of uh, outdoors activities. And I think in this day and age, 
um, where so many young people are uh, involved with technology, uh, they're on Netflix, they're on iPads, et cetera, et cetera, that parks and playgrounds and recreation programs are, are vital, uh, more so today, I think, than, than when we were younger. Uh, I'm excited to, uh, to uh, enter this race. Uh, by trade, I'm an attorney. I'm a regulatory attorney for the government. And uh, my platform, so to speak, is I want to ensure that uh, all parks and recreation uh, programs in the town of Milton are accessible to all. There's a, a large number of uh, groups that need them. And uh, more so than when I grew up here with the explosion of youth programs and, and sports, et cetera. But, uh, so I'm, ru I'm running to uh, preserve what we have and to the extent possible in fiscally challenging times to, um, to enhance what, what Milton offers. Uh, so again, thank you all for tuning in and for being here, and I ask for your vote on April 28th. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for holding this uh, great event tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian Manfield. Um, I am uh, married to my lovely wife, Nicole, uh, for going 15 years now. I have two uh, beautiful daughters. Uh, Julia is uh, 10, Allison is, uh, actually, Julia's 11, Allison's 9, no, uh, happens quick. And uh, <laughs> they go to uh, Cunningham School, so um, they, uh, <clears throat> I am a Milton firefighter. I've been a Milton firefighter for, uh, since 2002. Um, I am um, a proud uh, e-board member of, uh, I was past president, and I am the current secretary treasurer of the union, so I uh, have lots of leadership experience in the, uh, in the union, dealing with people and stuff, so I uh, bring that to the table. I am also a uh, owner of a small business. I own Veneto and Sons Oil. I've, been, I've owned that for 10 years now. Uh, so I'm uh, constantly working, but uh, um, I'm running for Parks Commissioner because uh, it's for my, my love of Milton. Um, and like I say, I, I coach softball. Uh, my daughters are on these parks all the time, so I have something that's important to me to, uh, to keep the upkeep of these parks. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great resource that we have at these parks. I mean, like, uh, like Bob was saying, um, kids are so in front of TVs all the time. Now you gotta, we need more programs and stuff to. Uh, keep these kids active and keep them going outside. So I think I'm uh, very passionate about that, keeping uh, looking for more programs. Um, also, the need for more space in town, for uh, more green space. I know it's difficult. Um, everybody wants more parks, but nobody wants them in their neighborhoods, but um, it's very important. The influx of new sports is Gaelic football. Rugby is very popular now. Lacrosse has taken off. It's just there's so many uh, new sports and so little fields to put them on. I think it's uh, very important that we use our resources to try to try to uh, find more space, more green space for uh, for the parks. And uh, I mean, there's some good programs in the the parks. The uh, the gym buddy program, great program, uh, helps with the special needs. Uh, my wife's a special needs teacher, so it's something that's important. My daughter helps out with the leap program at Cunningham uh, in her spare time, you know, for extra credit and stuff. So uh, I say it's something that's very important. It's a great program and. I say I'd like to see all these programs continue, and I say help to, uh, you know, get some more more programs going. And, uh, I would appreciate your vote on uh, April 28th. Thank you. Good, thanks, Brian. And there's just one more thing. Pat's I want to try to get all the candidates that are running this year on record on what they think about the override that's going to be on this April 28th election ballot. Um, this particular override is for a former firefighter who was injured on the job and his medical expenses. Um, the town's been paying it out of bonds in the past. So I'd, I'd just like to know whether both of you or either of you support this. Um, yeah, like I uh, just said, I, I am a firefighter. I was working that night that uh, Tony, Tony got hit. and. Uh, it's just a tough night, still thinking about it now. Um, 
But uh, Tony has been through a lot, and I don't think there should be a question that the town support this override. Um, Tony uh, and his family, they've been through so much. They're such a strong family, a great, great family. Um, I say Tony deserves this. You know, the town, I, I don't think it's even a question. I really don't. I mean, for what he gave, he basically gave his life. You know, this, his life's not the same as it was. And, uh, so he basically gave his, the life as he knew it for this town, and that's the least the town should do to, uh, to keep supporting Tony. It's our obligation. Thank you. Um, I concur uh, with Brian. Uh, this, this Tony was, was hurt in the line of duty, so in my mind there's, there's no question. Uh, the, the town has to do what's right, the right thing, and, and uh, uh, the override... Uh, uh, the money should should go to the override, and uh, this was a terrible, terrible accident. And uh, the town needs to to act in the best interest of of Tony. Well, thank you. You wrap it up, and I can go home and eat. Yeah, sounds good to me. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Right, thank thank you, you very much. At least blank won't beat you, right? <laughs> I hope blank. Blank has beaten a couple of. Contested in the past, you know. In other words, the, the, the no vote would have got more votes than the, the person that was running for the office. Well, I think the seat on the planning board is very important. I think the planning board is a very important board in town. This is an open seat. Ed, Ed Duffy um, has elected not to run for re election. I would like to thank Ed for his service to the town. Bernie, you, you and he too. served a long time yeah. together, yeah. and I, I think it's, um, we all owe um, all of you who've served on this board in the past a debt of gratitude. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of important decisions. Um, my husband and I moved to Milton about 16 years ago. Our children have been born and raised here. They attend the Milton Public Schools. They're growing up fast. My uh, son is at the middle school and my daughter's at the high school. Uh, we've come to know many people in Milton through their activities. Um, and like many people who have been here sitting at this table tonight, uh, we've wanted to offer uh, some of our skills in a volunteer effort in Milton. Um, I've done that for the last four or five years by serving on the Warrant Committee. I served as the Zoning Subcommittee Chair and the school subcommittee chair. I've um, been on the master plan committee the last two years and have attended a number of meetings, uh, hearing what other people in Milton think about our town and how we can preserve what we like about it and how we can act, be active in what we want to see change in our town. I've, I am a current town meeting member uh, from Precinct 9, and I also serve on the condominium uh, working group uh, of the planning board. A number of questions that you put to the selectmen have to do with planning. They have to do with decisions about our land use. I think these are things that are very important to people. They get very nervous when they hear about a new development coming and they become fearful that things are going to change in a way that they don't like. So what can we do about that? Well, People say, well, those decisions, where are they made? And they're made in a number of different places. But a lot of these decisions are made on the planning board, at the planning board level. Some people see frustration when they say, well, how can a, a property at 131 Elliott sit vacant for so many years? How can we have large overscale developments, 40B developments, proposed on sites when something else was denied? Well, we can do better by making our process better. We can make our planning board decision-making process better. We can make it more deliberate, and we can make it more systematic. And we can do this by implementing our master plan. There's a lot of good work that went into the master plan, a lot of participation. And there's more work to be done. There's more study to be done. But some of the things that have come out of that master plan that I think there's good consensus on is our commercial districts can be more vibrant. We can look at introducing a mix of uses in them. Is it, uh, it's not uncommon now for towns to mix some of their uses. 
You don't have to segregate them. You can live above the store. We can also look at our housing. I think it was noted earlier that senior citizens who might want to downsize have few options. But so do young families who are looking to stay in Milton. The young families that grew up here, the young people who grew up here who want to raise their families here. What are their options? That's one of the things we're looking at on this condominium working group. Can we look at condominium zoning in certain parts of town that would offer more range of housing types? The other thing that came out of the master plan is people like the historic character of the town and they like lots of the open space. But is it protected? Some of it is, but a lot of it's not. And we can plan to protect it deliberately through zoning and through our master plan process. People talk about traffic. Traffic is a regional problem, but we don't always have to be in our cars. If we make our streets and sidewalks more desirable to walk on and to bike on, then people won't get in their car for every errand they need to run. They can get better access to the T and take public transit. These are some of the things that I think are easy first steps and there's more complicated steps that we can take with further input from residents in the town. Most importantly though, for me, is a process has to do with how we make our decisions. I have an informed background. I'm an architect. I've been designing buildings, going through community process, presenting in front of zoning boards and boards of appeal for over 30 years. This is my work day to day. I can bring that experience and that skill set to the table. I also can bring a balance to our decision making. I like to listen to all sides and make an informed decision. And I will be respectful to everyone who comes before the planning board. So I ask for your vote and thank you for your support. April 28th, Cheryl Tagayas, thank you. Cheryl, take your sign, you can use it five years from now. Give it to my kids and put a scrapbook? No, but you'll be using it in five years. Well, that's it. So get out and vote the 28th, and at 8 o'clock in the evening on the 28th, you can turn into Channel 8 again and watch me and my other compatriots uh, have to, we do the election results show. And we're shy a couple of members, so I might be calling people. <laughs> All right, well, great. <laughs> great. <laughs> so good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Thank yeah. you, Bernie. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Bernie.